Beverly Crusher took Jack to the Crimson Arboretum when he was a boy. Data hopes he and his friends die quickly. And Captain Picard misses the carpet on the Enterprise D. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. <laughs> hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today we're doing a review of Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 9, entitled Vox, written by Sean Tretta and Kylie Rossiter, directed by what? Terry Metalis. And we have a very special guest today, everybody. And I think you might know why he's here. It's Mr. Doug Drexler. Hello, Doug, and thank you so Harry much. Metallus! Hello. <laughs> he's my new hero. Well, he's been my hero for a while, but, you know, he really has done the most amazing thing. It's so exciting to be getting towards the end of this, and it's delivered. And most of the yeah. fans I talk to feel like it delivered. Lots of, lots of laughs and heartfelt moments and tears. I mean, mm -hmm. I've cried all the way through this show, you know, from the first episode. It got me, you know. Well, first things first, I think the big thing yeah. that everybody it was blown away by, a few things, but at the end, we finally get to see, again, the Enterprise D. <laughs> How much a part of rebuilding this thing, uh, Doug, were you? Well, uh, I didn't have anything physically to do with rebuilding it, but when Dave told me, of course, you know, he spoke to Mike for the graphics and stuff like that and spoke to me, anyone who was there. I mean, I spent a lot of time on that set. Uh, and it, when I heard that we were going to do the Enterprise D, it was like, well, guess what? Because I know Paramount doesn't have the blueprints. They don't keep anything. Got nothing. <laughs> on, like the last week I was on Enterprise, Fritz Zimmerman, Herman's son, who was a set designer, says, hey, Dougie, I'm going to go have some blueprints made. Is there anything you want? And I said, yeah, I'd like a complete set of the original, of the, of the uh, uh, Next Generation D-Bridge. And he was like, sure. And he went and he had an entire, it's like a roll like this. And uh, Dave told me, they've been in my garage for like 20 something years, you know. And uh, when Dave told me, I'm like, well, guess what? This is your lucky day. <laughs> 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 and they sent uh, a guy over to pick them up and they scanned them. Of course, they have to redo. They have to redraw them. Because the way things are done now is that you want to have them like in a CAD program or whatever they're using so that if you want to print some of it, you know, you can actually do that. It's really stunning. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I feel like I saved the starship. <laughs> Thank you. Did. Thank you. <laughs> For all of us. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on the original set as a makeup artist. You know, I mean, right. you looked on the stages if you were a makeup artist or an actor, you know. And it was mind blowing. The only, the, the main difference is that a lot of the materials and things are better. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not backlits on, on the walls. Those are like, it's all monitors. It's all playback. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, even the helm panels. And um, uh, it's just, it really, it really takes your breath away. Uh, the thing about Picard is that the whole season three is about coming full circle for everybody, all the actors, but not only the yeah. actors, but behind the scenes too. That's exactly. like coming full circle. It was com like coming home for them. It was coming home for me, for Mike, Denise, you know. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, for instance, <laughs> like on the helm and consoles, you'll see the little, where the plexi meets the, the, uh, the cabinet. Uh, there's a black strip that goes around that's uh, on in the old days, it was black masking tape and it was done to prevent light leaks between the plexi and the, th these are, it's actually printed in or painted into the material so that it looks, they don't need to do that. They don't have fluorescent lights on there anymore. You know, <laughs> fluorescent <laughs> lights. I mean, the universe was run on fluorescent lights uh, back in the nineties and two thousands. And now they have if it isn't playback, they've got LED tape, and it's really remarkable. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. So that um, the bridge that we see in this episode is actually built to scale. It's all uh, oh yeah, reproduction oh, yeah. is yeah. as good I, as it gets. Oh yeah, I mean it's a spectacular job. I, you know the place where you really could mess up, and they didn't. They pulled it off beautifully. Is that Voyager? Wood? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
ah, <laughs> wood grain on the rail. Oh my God, whoever they had, whoever the painter was who did that. And you know, they do those kind of things. I don't know if they're, who knows, maybe I'm so, maybe they're printing it. I, I know that uh, painters used to work with feathers and stuff to make those mm. kinds of striations, you know? Uh, so it's, that is the easiest place to go off track, uh, doing the, the grain on that rail. And of course the colors too, if they don't hit just right, it's going to look odd, you know? Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's an astonishing reproduction. Astonishing. I mean, they mm. spared nothing to do it, you know. And the thing is, you have to remember, you've got people working on a show who we do it for free. You, <laughs> you say know? that now Don't that after them. you've collected everything, yeah. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> but, I mean, you, you do it for free. And, you, and it's not just behind the camera. It's in front of the camera, too. And we're Jonathan Frakes. You know, they're all giddy about it and enjoying it and having the same amazing feelings that we had when we walked out at the first time you know you know you mentioned uh -huh. full circle uh doug and that's exactly what i was thinking uh this morning was you you and your career and and how interesting it must be to look back on the the full scale of your career and and you've you've kind of done this this full circle where you know you had all those amazing times and those amazing creations over 30 years ago. Now, 30 plus years later, here you are doing again amazing and creative creations for the Star Trek universe. I'm sure this has hit you. Um, yeah, yeah. What's what's that feel like? Well, uh, the thing I have to... There was like two decades there where if you ha were a legacy worker or you, know, you had worked on the old shows, they really didn't want you. Um, because they were hoping to kind of uh, put their own bend into it. You know, if they bring in people who worked on it before, we're just going to get more of what we had. And I get that. I totally get that. Um, I think it was a mistake, personally. Uh, I, I could accept it if I split the universe into different universes. I could go, well, okay, this is different over here because it's not the universe that the 90s and 2000s, that's a whole different. The card is part of that original universe the others aren't and there's nothing wrong with that at all that's totally fine it's, it's science fiction spin it any way you want to you know um but to when when dave blast came in who loves star trek and knows everything i mean i think i told you that when we first were messenger and he showed me had pictures of himself in like one of those maroon movie uniforms as a kid you know wrath of Khan. Yeah, and uh, and then Terry Metalis, you know, yeah. I mean, he was weaned on those shows. He, that's where he started his career. Mm -hmm. It means a lot to him. Plus, he's our friend, and we're his friends. And, you know, so it was a perfect storm for a Star Trek series. You know, you had Terry and you had Dave. Terry was, you know, uh, the guy who, you know, hand was on the tiller and knew the right places to hit. I mean, oh my God, listen to the score. Yeah. Usually you do a TV series, every TV series, they burn the score from before. They never even use it again. It's, if you watch the original Star Trek, they reused a lot of musical mm -hmm. cues for certain kinds of things. And it's the same thing as having a favorite song. If you're listening to your favorite song at some kind of a, you know, you had a date with a girl or something like that, that song comes on and all that comes rushing back. Well, when Terry picks out moments in the scores over the last how many years back to the motion picture and says i need that sting i need that sting and we want to put it here here and here because when the fans hear it they get the sense memory of a wonderful moment from star trek before you can't just hire somebody i don't care how good a producer they are if they don't know that stuff they're not going to think of it how can they they can't think of it so Terry is really like hitting on all cylinders as far as psychologically Pavlov's dog, <laughs> you know, it, works. That bell. it makes you, yeah. uh, it really is. Um, he's gotten me so many times. I mean, I, I'm not kidding when I say I've broken down numerous times uh, throughout the entire run of the thing, you know, where I, I really like cried, you know, of course I'm in a, an emotionally fragile state, although I'm getting better. Um, I found I've become much more emotional. <laughs> 
in the last year or so. But uh, yeah, I mean, the shows, because Terry just knows how to, and this is, and people have to understand what it's like to work on a show like this with someone like Terry, who's not just doing it one job like me he's like having to look at everybody's job and he also is smart enough to know that if you hire the right people you don't have to micromanage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've worked on other shows where they may have the right person in the position but they get micromanage the hell out of them you know and name those shows I can't. No, I'm just <laughs> I can't. But um, and it's and I'm not saying that what they did was wrong because basically it's your show. And if you need to feel like you have the say on every little thing, but I mean, just imagine it, Terry and Dave, there's certain things they don't have to worry about when Michael Kuda's on it or I'm on it. They'll look at it, but they're gonna, you know, they're they they are predisposed to like what we do because mm -hmm. they feel like we kind of wrote the book on a lot of it, you know, and they feel like, well, I, I, yeah, I may be in charge, but I'm really interested in what you think about this. Are you happy? Are you going to be happy? And I get asked that question. Other shows, I don't get that so much. Which, hey, I've never been on a show where the checks bounced yet. So I'm okay <laughs> with that. That's the way they want to do the show. I'm a hundred percent any way you want to do it. But you know, um, I had a lot more freedom on this show than I've had in a long time. M mm -hmm. More like back in the 90s and 2000s where, you know, like Ira Bear didn't get involved with writing the Deep Space Nine tech manual. He was like, you guys do that. I don't do that. You know, that that's that's really wonderful freedom. You don't get everywhere. My name being on a starship on the screen. Yes. I've been on other shows where you'd have to go through a whole chain of, and then they would say, well, well why? Or yeah. no, forget it. You know, absolutely fine. Every show is a different ecosystem. That's how they want to run it. And, and I'm more than willing to work that way. But I have to say that I enjoy the freedom that I get when I'm on Star Trek and a huge amount of respect right to the top. You know, you can't beat that. And I'm wearing these glasses so that every once in a while when you ask me, I can whip them yeah. off. <laughs> They're very good at it. Very good, Doug. <laughs> Uh, you know what? We've been saying this the whole time that uh, Terry Metalis has done a fantastic job, with, specifically with this final season of uh, oh. Picard. This third well, season has been, it's well, just motion this picture. This is yeah. the season where he had the most control. Mm. You know? uh, okay. It's mostly, you know, uh-oh, did we lose Sarah? No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. That's why That's why it looks so good. Yeah. Because it, sta it stands out. I mean, it just looks it, like. It's another it's, show. Look, even a different title sequence. Those first two seasons, I think, are really interesting, especially in the face of season three. Once you have season three and you get the big payoff, you might be able to go back and watch the other ones and see Picard from ground level in a granular way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it will be interesting to revisit the first two seasons now that we've seen where it ends up, you know. Yeah. He's done a fantastic job with this third season. Uh, the Like you said, playing on our emotions with – the music with the sets uh with the the whole introduction of all the characters that we love you know bringing oh, yeah. them back all of the wharf and the, the moments oh. that are just fantastic yeah yeah um how, what what's the vibe on your ship like well if i if i had to if i was on your ship and on the uss to, uh, drexler yeah, yeah. What was the, what's the vibe on there yeah yes. you know it'd probably be a little lax i'm thinking you know <laughs> running around in t-shirts and there's an open know, mic night pants. every monday <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no pants tuesdays on the bridge you know, <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> all right gotta uh, apply for a transfer then I need yeah give <laughs> me a wait list on that one yeah Doug, um what can you walk us through the process of when you were first approached to help out on Picard, what was, what did that look like? Was that just a a text? Was it, you know, shooting the shit over well, beers, you know, or, or? No, actually, it's really kind of funny because I was had been chatting with Dave Blass on Facebook Messenger. I didn't know he was going to be the production designer on Star Trek Picard. I had no idea. I just thought he was a guy who, who was in the business, but you know, really loved 
Star Trek. And we, you know, there's that instantaneous connection if you have a Star Trek background, mm -hmm. even if you've never met in your life, you know, you're talking mm -hmm. like old friends. And we hit it off right away. I mean, I really love Dave. Dave was an easygoing, funny, great, irreverent sense of humor. Um, not someone who freaks out, you know. I mean, everyone can freak out, but he, you know, he was he's cool under fire and he has the best interests of Star Trek. Not just the show he's doing, he has the best interests of Star Trek, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in his mind. Uh, so I was chatting with him for a while and I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and just one day he told me and I flipped out. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, he wanted he wanted to to get the he said, I want to get the band back together. It's, it's, you know, just like the Blues Brothers. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to get the band back together. And I was amazed uh, because we'd been kind of kept on the outside for a while, a long time. And um, I told him I would jump at that, of course. And frankly, I thought he was going to ask me to do graphics. And graphics is like, I'm not taking anything away from graphics because it's hard work. But say, for instance, compared to, for me anyway, visual effects is grueling. You know, if you're in the art department, you generally go home at five o'clock. You know, it's a little more civilized. And, and graphics for civilized. me is, not that I don't, I sweat everything I do. But um, a graphics is, say, a much easier job, in my opinion, than being a conceptual illustrator. Because they don't look at the graphics. They do look at the graphics, but it's not like looking at an, a ship that's going to be featured on screen. I mean, it's like they really... And, and you might get somebody who says, well, I don't know what I want, but uh, I'll know it when I see it. I mean, you hear that so often. And those are the kind of people who make you do different designs until the very last second. And then they end up going back to the first one. Yeah. And like I said, that's, <laughs> if that's the way you do it. That's like your process. That's your pipeline, you know? Um, uh, but uh, with Terry, there wasn't, I mean, you know, Terry had asks and requests and things, but there was no like beating over the head, you know, and sending you back again and again and again, you know, change something that's maybe going to be this big on screen. You could put that time somewhere else. That was more important. Terry has a great, he ha has a sense of what's important, you know. Um, so anyway, I didn't know Dave was going to ask me to do ships. <laughs> and uh, the thing <laughs> was that uh, I dreaded the idea of doing the ships because I had been stuck in that ship design loop where it's just like endless 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 and um i think tobias richter said are you going to do ships and i said i'd rather eat worms the tobias richter <laughs> out in germany tobias and um uh then when i found out that it was actually ships i had a panic attack on the first day i admit i had a panic attack i because of covid i really went and dug into a program before Dave ever talked to me, like for a few months called Modo for, for building. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't building starships to learn. I was building automobiles, you know, like Lamborghinis and stuff like that. If you could do that, that's my advice to anyone who loves doing ships or wants to be a modeler. Forget the starships. Model a Lamborghini. If you could do that, there's no starship in the world that that you won't be able to do. You know, so I had been doing that and it just so happened. It was just the luck of the draw. That I had reached a, a, a high level in the program when Dave offered me the job, but I wasn't battle tested yet. So I remember on the first day freaking out. <laughs> Dorothy talked me off a ledge that day. Doug, mm. you're Doug F. and Drexler, okay? That's exactly what <laughs> she said. I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. <laughs> I just burst out laughing, and that, I don't. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's right. I'm Doug F. <laughs> 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 but i mean i that, you know dorothy was famous for that she knew me so well you know and um she she knew how to calm me down and i just had the best time working with john eves and dave blass you know and then we had some designs that terry liked you know he saw um uh, bill krauss's uh concept for one of his ships that he liked uh actually there were two bill krauss ships and basically what happens there is that I will spin off of what Bill did for those two ships, like the Intrepid and the Titan. Take the basic idea and spin it off into the Picard universe, 
and the mm. types of engines that we use and maybe sweeten the lines a little bit. And, and I mean, look, <laughs> I, I'm not blowing my own horn here, but I'm one of the best guys you could possibly have working in a starship. I know everything about them, you know, and I, and uh, I'm not trying to do Star Wars or video games. I'm doing Star Trek, you know, and it's all about yeah. aircraft logic. You're doing the Enterprise D. Heck yeah, you know. So uh, to me, uh, and Star Trek starships are like nothing else. I mean, they really inspire and uh, and people just fall in love with them. I've been in love with them forever. And and if if they're not authentic, you know, if the, if the whole paneling looks like, you know, like it was done with a shotgun. <laughs> you know, it just, the thing about a Star Trek starship is when fans look at it, the closer they look at it, there's more. And they can look at it and say, I know if I pull this panel off what I'm going to find. And there's a transporter emitter. And there, you know, all those little things that fans look for. And if they don't find them, their knives come out. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love that, that kind of, you know, that's that's amazing uh, affection there that they know it that well, and that if you don't know it at least as well as they do, they're kind of offended by it. You know, who do you think you are? You don't know anything about starships. This is this isn't Starfleet. You know. Oh, you've uh, met Star Trek fans then. <laughs> <laughs> they're really the most amazing fans. I mean, some of them can be a little. Most of them are beautiful but you'll get some real noisy ones who uh have an angry streak to them and they're looking to vent because maybe mommy didn't make their lunch for them or something i don't know and they'll come at you i mean angry and and actually abusive i mean i've had some that are abusive uh but on the other hand you have to understand that even if they're being destructive in their criticism they're still interested. You right. Know, that's really it, amazing. It, 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 come, it comes from a place of caring, even yes. if it's too much caring, but it's still yeah. about I'm caring. I'm sorry about the mommy sandwich remark. I want to take <laughs> that back right now because that really was wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> No, it comes but from yeah. a place of caring. Yeah. I mean, I told that to Dave. I told, Because to Dave, that's pretty new, you know, to, to work on something that people are so... Uh, committed to and that there's a way for them to go online and you know praise you to the heavens or rip you to shreds and mike denise and i you know were worked on the first show where there was that enterprise it was the first time we had like immediate internet yeah. it wasn't anything like today but it, you know you go on there and um i mean it's amazing how many people love the nx now but oh my god when enterprise came out it was vicious i love it <laughs> I love it. I love the refit. Uh, people mm -hmm. flipped out, and the refit was only like this big on the screen, and everyone was like, yeah! <laughs> and, and it was really awesome. Uh, wouldn't it be great to see that in the show? Mm -hmm. My only fear is that if they do it and I'm not there, I need to be there. You know what I mean? I need to protect the ship. Yeah. Um, you know, when I came to work with Mike Okuda, he said, our first priority is protecting the Enterprise. It's one of the first things he said to me. It looked gorgeous. It looked absolutely freaking amazing in this episode actually i know we only have you for a little bit more time here yeah. doug but watching the enterprise uh interior and exterior um in this episode as well as just seeing the ships seeing everything over this whole uh season what's the overall feeling you're getting is it is it even better than you imagined you know is it is it fulfilling what what are you feeling you mean the series overall or the set? The series itself? overall, as well as seeing the uh, Enterprise reveal in this episode, episode nine. Well, I mean, the series overall is like this incredible, Mike Okuda and I have talked about this before. It's a fantastic gift that we've been given. It's this wonderful bow on an amazing career, you know? Uh, and that feeling of full circle that I talked about, um, it's probably course there was a supernatural feeling about coming to work on next generation back then because it was my first star trek show and gene rodbury was still there and that was a supernatural feeling uh but this is a supernatural feeling like that that you're you're back in time and not only and and behind the scenes to get the amazing uh respect 
from you know people like Terry and Dave Blass. That's and to work on that show and that they care about what we think. That's you know it's really gets you here. Uh, as far as the work that was done on the show is just stunning. I mean, and that bridge, uh, Liz Klakowski, I always have trouble saying uh -huh. that. I'm sorry, Liz. Um, she was the immediate art director that worked under Dave on the thing, and on the bridge. And she is such an amazing She also worker. worked on the Orville, I believe. Did she? I believe so, yeah. Really? I don't, not while I was there. She must have been and the, the uh, And the Voyager documentary. Oh, well, she's just wonderful. She's just, you know, she just uh, impressed us all so much. I mean, when I, I look at the pictures of the bridge, the colors are so perfect, you know. Uh, I mean, for instance, when they did the remastering of Next Generation, they tweaked the reds on the uniforms so that they don't look anything like what I remember them. Uh, and that bothers me when I watch the remasters. Uh, too saturated and too much to the red side. And really, they're more like a wine, you know, color. Uh, when I look at that bridge, it's like it just nails it, just totally nails it. Uh, it's stunning. Um, it's a lot of it is much more sophisticated than what they were able to do. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, up near the ceiling, there are these kind of like half round pipes that go around the top of the ceiling. I mean, on the on uh, Next Generation, I think they were pool noodles. They painted pool noodles and bent them. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but uh, and and like for instance, that I'm not even sure exactly where the did they did they have a rail that they made a mold off of from the original. I'm not sure. It's it's so close. Um, once again, I got to say that paint job on the rail, that wood grain. Holy crap! If you're going to go wrong, that's where it's such a subtle thing. You know, that's where you really could could lose it. And people might not be able to put their finger on why it bothers them. But I, I'm telling I, I, I was looking for the chairs, Doug. I, I was looking more at the the leather on the captain's chair. You know, those the leather, the way those chairs look was perfect. It looks really terrific. It's so easy to go wrong. So, so easy to go wrong. And uh, we were just beside ourselves. We... You know, a lot of us work from home because it was in the middle of COVID. Uh, so Mike, Denise, and I went up when it was first being put together. And then we came up when it was finished. And uh, uh, it's just mind-altering, really. Uh, it really does change the way your brain is wired a little bit, I have to say. You know, mm -hmm. it has such an amazing effect. Uh, and of course, we have a family of people that we're still super close with after all these years. You know, I mean, uh, me, Mike, and Denise are like family. You know, and we've been through a lot since since those days, lots mm -hmm. and lots. So, you know, some of it just crazy through the roof. Uh, you know, it's just like the crew of the D when they get back together; they know each other so well. You know, we had that behind the camera too. You know. Also, I got to say that in my 42 years, this is the most fun cast I'd ever worked with. Nice. They were so silly. I mean, John <laughs> Brakes is very silly. Yeah, we heard about them. Spiner is very silly. <laughs> Dorn can really be silly. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know that I ever actually saw them do a normal rehearsal. Every rehearsal was making up their own dialogue and poking fun at each other and but as soon as they call action, it was like, bang, you know, and, and Love it. later we get to uh, uh, LeVar Burton. I mean, I remember where he had these scenes with complicated techno babble and he would just plow through it with such, you know, he totally believed it and sold it every time. You know? That's what uh, I was telling Ciroc, like I was always most impressed with LeVar Burton on The Next Generation because He's better than anybody else at having these words that yeah. nobody's ever heard of, but he's yeah. delivering it as if he knows what it means. He, yes. He, well, he you remember understands the episode, it. Remember the episode Minefield? Yes. Where the Enterprise found itself in the middle of an asteroid field and there were all these uh, things implanted in the asteroids that like whatever energy they put out, it would be used against. It was LeVar goes into the holodeck 
And he calls up a lab back at Utopia Planitia and brings back Leia Brahms, I guess. Yeah, her name was. Leia Brahms. Yeah. That's a wonderful episode. And it's such a showcase for LeVar. Mm. And he spews out with unbelievable enthusiasm. Of, oh, I see where you're going. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you're believing it. Uh, there's a few <laughs> movies where Altered States. You ever see Altered States? Mm -mm. Oh, my God. Uh, Patty Chayefsky wrote the script. It was, who was the director on it? I can't remember. Dick Smith had all kinds of amazing makeup effects that were not CGI. And that's the first time I ever heard Technobabble spew in such a way. Uh, William Hurt was a scientist. The spewing of Technobabble was right there. The Technobabble there and the Technobabble on Star Trek after Next Generation. They're so related. Uh, I don't know if I've ever asked. My, I probably did ask Mike if there was a, if he thought there was any influence between all the states. And if oh, if well, look, watch Altered States. It's a movie you should see anyway. You know, and really play Altered great. Beast, everybody. If you remember that game, Altered, Altered Beast. Altered Beast. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you remember that. Well, no. hey Doug, I just want to tell you, I I looked up Liz. I thought for sure she'd worked on the Orville, but it seems like maybe I was mistaken. Um, so correction there. It doesn't seem like Liz. Uh, had worked on Orville, but I thought she had. You should talk to her. She's unbelievable. But yeah, uh, her her work is incredible. Plus, I, the other thing I have to say is she has such style when it comes to the way she dresses. Every day she came in, not just doing an amazing job, but looking so coordinated and beautifully put together, you know? Uh, it, you it, like Ciroc. I like Ciroc and, and the hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Doug, this has been freaking amazing we really appreciate yeah. you coming on and joining well, us we really appreciate you joining yeah. star trek picard for the fans uh i can speak on behalf of them and say that we are very happy that you said yes um <laughs> but really thank you so much doug this has been really cool and we're really looking forward to episode 10 listen i tell you what's so fulfilling is seeing the fans almost across the board really be excited and emotional about it wow and with all of us coming back you know uh old gang original gangster whatever you want to call it you know oh gee uh, that's so fulfilling oh gee yeah so fulfilling yeah. incredibly fulfilling thanks guys you Thank did a you. great job Doug. we loved it this was an awesome incredible team uh like i said star trek picard was the perfect storm perfect mm -hmm. storm we don't have a storm like that again and everybody <laughs> stick around. Uh, we're going to take a super quick break and we'll be right back. Uh, until then, say thank you very much to Mr. Doug Drexler for saving Star Trek for all of us. <laughs> at least at least the Enterprise D. Uh, we'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hey, hello, hello. Man, that was fun. We nerded out so hard. He was showing us cool uh, Lamborghini models and all that in between, as in models of Lamborghinis, not mon <laughs> Lamborghini models. Uh, here are the trivioids of the week. There were a few fun ones. They go as follows. Symbols have nothing but meaning. Beverly Crusher took Jack to the Crimson Arboretum when he was a boy. Starfleet misdiagnosed Picard with Eremotic Syndrome. Keslavar is no academy. It's an institution. All Borg undergo genetic alterations so that their bodies can communicate with their cybernetic components. Data hopes he and his friends die quickly. And what Picard misses <laughs> the most on the D is the carpet. Um, <laughs> what? That's what uh, uh well phrased the carpeting on the Enterprise D is what he misses the most. <laughs> the feeling of that carpet. Um, that's kind of like an old inside joke with, with Star Trek is the the conversation about the carpet on the bridge. I feel like somebody, I can't remember. Everybody in the live chat and in the comments below, please remind us what what's the story about the carpeting on the bridge? That is definitely a an inside Star Trek joke. Uh, it's a deep cut. So real quick, there were a lot of really cool ships. One, you know, on the on the view screen, you could see the USS Drexler, the Torango, uh, named after Sean Torango, 
Uh, there was the Akuda, of course, uh, Michael and Denise Akuda. Then there were a few more I spied. There was uh, the Hikaru Sulu, Hikaru Sulu. There was the Cochrane. Uh, is that from Cochrane? There was the Luna. I'm assuming, well, maybe that's just named after the moon, but I was thinking of Barbara Luna. Uh, there was the Trumbull as well. Those were the ones I caught that I recognized. Everybody in the comments below, let us know if there were other ships you recognized uh, that were named after people. And uh, let us know who those people were, because uh, those were the ones I caught. I mean, obviously, there were others like, uh, I don't remember, it wasn't the Reliant, but there were a couple other ships that we remembered seeing in the past. Um, also, Sirach, Admiral Shelby. So Admiral yeah. Shelby, uh, the lady who we just saw die, was another character that they brought back from the next generation only to kill her off, like like Ensign Rowe or <laughs> like Rowe Laren. <laughs> but uh, Commander Shelby was in a fantastic, one of the best ever two-part episodes with the Borg. Uh, it's played by Elizabeth Dennehy, uh, Brian Dennehy's daughter. And so it was really cool to see her. She had some incredible scenes with Riker. Uh, my favorite scene with Riker is she's basically told him, she's like, can I be frank? You know, and he says, sure. And she says, you're in my way. And it was just this really great scene in like a turbo lift where she was trying to get promoted and she wanted to be first officer of the Enterprise under Jean-Luc Picard. And Riker kept getting offered his own captaincies and he was refusing to take them because he wanted to stay with Picard. And she's like, get the out of the way. Take your take your promotion so I can get this spot with Picard. So it was really cool. Really great to see her again. It brought her back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good call back. It's funny because, you know, you do a job like 25 years ago and next thing you know, you get a phone call and they're like, hey, we want to bring you in again. <laughs> it's like, really? So that's uh, that's a great call back for her. Mm -hmm. um, did you notice... And then, then maybe it's just me, but did you notice Major Roddenberry's voice at, at the it was end there? Absolutely, her voice. Yes, and that was just that was perfect. classy. That was really classy. I don't know if they pieced together something she had said in the past and just took her audio, or if they uh, did some kind of AI generated audio. But it was pretty. I think that's what they have. Amazing. Yeah, and so that was really beautiful. And, and and of course, we couldn't have it any other way. If we heard someone else's voice, we would kind of, you know, flinch at it. You know, we kind of cringe a little bit at it. But they did it. They did it right. Uh, like everything, like Doug Drexler said, they built it, the bridge of the Enterprise, to the exact specs that he saved himself. Uh, and it was so cool. I mean, I know Star Trek fans... Next Generation fans just absolutely lost it when those lights were coming up and we we're seeing the whole bridge as well as when we saw the D coming out of Hangar 12 uh, at the shipyard, just seeing it come out looking so beautiful. It, it was just a, a gigantic highlight moment for me in this whole series. Yeah, it was special. Um, I was I was anticipating the lights coming on and uh i wanted to see those chairs so badly <laughs> the way you know those three <laughs> chairs sitting there with the two in front and as soon as they they brought the pan down on those chairs and uh uh jordy sits in his his spot and data sits in his spot and everybody's kind of like back at the back at the old spots you know yep. uh, troy's right there on her on the captain's side number one's on the other side and it's just like you know it was good old times it was like it re really was the i think doug said bringing back the the gang i felt mm -hmm. like it was the gang coming back together again it was, it was special to watch you know actually another ship that we heard was the uss pulaski we heard the USS Pulaski. That's such another huge, brilliant uh, Star Trek thing. Uh, USS Pulaski. 
What we need right now is our good friend and associate producer, Homer Frizzell, to tell us, is that a non-appearance mention for Dr. Pulaski? Because it was a non-appearance mention for the ship of the USS Pulaski. Does that count as a non-appearance mention for the character, Dr. Mm. Pulaski, uh, played by Diana Moldar? Uh, really cool. Also, we had a non-appearance mention for Wesley. Uh, when Beverly Crusher was saying, you know, I gave Wesley a lot of space. So that was really cool. Uh, there were so many big things and big moments. And uh, here we are. One episode left, Ciroc. <laughs> what's what's going to happen? Um, oh, you know what's going to happen, but you just want to see how it's going to happen. You know, uh, we all know what's going to happen. The good guys win um it's just going to be how it unfolds and um i just think that you know i'm glad that they mentioned wesley because i was a little upset if they didn't if they went through this whole season without mentioning wesley i would have been upset about it it was one of my it was in the back of my mind as kind of a pet peeve mm -hmm. because you know you got two kids uh one of them we grew up watching on the show and it's not fair if you don't even at least mention the guy, you know. Um, so I'm glad that they did do that because it, it made sense. They got Captain Shaw, you know. <laughs> I was sad to see him die in this episode as well. That was another big moment for me. Um, watching Jin's character take over the Titan kind of yeah you know. what's up with the what's up with the kid hey the kids aren't all right man you know kids these <laughs> days you just can't trust them they just right we've all <laughs> kind of suspected that everybody under 25 they're yeah. we, we can't trust them at some point they're all gonna just turn on us and, and teach us all a lesson <laughs> and take everything over and there's there's our proof right there <laughs> Uh, but that was really cool. It was cool to see them all turn into board. It makes you wonder, wow, there are a lot of officers under 25 on that ship. They are chock yeah. full of ensigns on that ship. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought Marina Sirtis had the best line in the episode, Troy, when she said, I, I've never been so happy to see so many wrinkles. Yeah. <laughs> I love that line. Um, of course, it could be, you know, debated with the other line that was great, too. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier, but there were some good moments. I mean, I I like the scene between uh, Jack and uh, Picard when he's kind of ribbing him for not being a father. Mm -hmm. And he was like... Uh, what about the protocol? What about the protocols of a father? Or were you never issued those? I thought that was a real stinger. Ouch. That was a real stinger for me watching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that I thought was a real kind of good moment for Picard when he says uh, he inherited the best of you and the worst of me. I thought that was yeah. another well-written line. You know, oh, and by the way, uh, how they mentioned, you know, Jordy rebuilt uh, the D and he yeah. did that uh, because the the saucer section was destroyed in their first movie, Star Trek Generations. Uh, that was with uh, Deanna Troy notoriously at the helm, infamously, infamously at the helm. So that's why they mentioned, what was it, Viridian 3? Uh, because like the saucer section crashed. And so that pretty much was the end of the Enterprise D and that's why they went on to the E. But apparently Geordi was able to retrieve that uh, because of the smart reasoning, because the prime directive. So the natives, they don't want the natives to see that saucer section and that changes all their uh, technological advancements and all that. That was really smart. Um, there was also, oh, there was an interesting comment when Picard says the irony of her endorsing something so Borg-like and Picard was saying that about uh, Admiral Shelby. And the reason for that is because the she was very, you know, against the Borg or whatever, because 
she was in uh, The Best of Both Worlds, I believe was the two part episode and which was it was a very Borg centric episode. So it's just funny for her to be, you know, so so what was it endorsing something so Borg like when she was so anti Borg on The Next Generation, just something interesting. But lastly, on the Borg, I found it a little strange that when the seven of the next the seven next generation crew people were discussing the borg and you know theorizing and figuring it out you've got picard's experiences you've got crusher's expertise and geordie's expertise and data they should have had seven of nine i think in that meeting being that she still has borg implants she's got her implants on and you know it just would have been nice to hear what she had to say about that uh it kind of was missing to me yeah that scene was a little bit awkward because of the way they figured it out i just felt like it was too staggered each person was like yeah and then they used the transporters for this and the next guy was like and it was because of the genetic code it was like it was too much welcome to star trek (laughs) <laughs> it was too much of that at the same time. Yeah. I don't mind it spread out, you know, where yeah. it's like, oh, maybe they're using the transporters and then beat, and then something else, something else, something else, and then go into, oh, what about the genetic code from Daystrom Academy? All right, then, you know, but it literally was one shot here, then cut over here to Jordy. He says something, then cut over to Riker, and he says, well, what about the, and, then it, and it was just like five of them. Five whatabouts in a row. And I was like, come on, this is this is a little bit too much of like, you know, the figure everything out at one moment. But, you know, I'm glad that um, Picard finally got rid of his irritable bowel syndrome or aromatic bowel syndrome. Yeah. What, Close is, what is it? Aromat- like aromatic syndrome. Oh, oh. Aromatic yeah. bowel syndrome. <laughs> I'm glad he got rid of that. Um, there were great moments too. I love the data. I data had the best moment too. He also had the best line, one of the best when he says, "I hope we die quickly." It was a great comeback. Mm-hmm. Um, also, like the moment when he puts his hand on his show on Picard's shoulder and and he says, "I yeah. know." Very. Beautiful. It was two words, but it was beautiful, and it was just like, you know, it was. Just and an also. Understanding- it shows data being a little bit more human because he was searching for the right words to comfort him. And then Picard says something like, I don't think there are any words to comfort me. And so data uses a physical gesture to comfort him. Yeah. And, and that shows that he's getting closer and closer to humanity because he knew, look, there are no words that can help, but maybe just, you know, person to person, compassion, touch, a gesture. And, and, you know, Picard felt it. You could see that he, he appreciated that gesture. Really good moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they still didn't do the reveal on who the Borg queen is. I'm, I, you know, I'm just going to guess Amanda Plummer. That's my guess. They kind of sounded like the, that was the voice I heard when they, when I was hearing voices, I could be totally wrong. I don't know. But uh, they didn't do the reveal. Still going to be interested to see that. But overall, it's just, um, you know, it's just a good episode. It's just the whole season has been good. So, you know, we've got one more to go. And I know they're going to wrap a lot of things up in a pretty bow. Yeah. But, they but better. you know, <laughs> yeah, they be better. they've been teasing us long enough. You know, I was waiting for that board queen reveal, too. And. It sounded to me, the voice, and I could be completely wrong on this. It sounded to me like the voice of Alice Krieger, who played the Borg Queen in Star Trek First Contact. And I kept waiting for them to show her face. Uh, I I don't know. It really very much sounded to me like it was her. Uh, but you know, it could be Amanda Plummer. It could be Agnes Girardi, for all we know. Yeah, um, for all, yeah. No. Yeah, we haven't seen Agnes. Somebody new. Yeah. Probably um, not Agnes. It would be great if it were, 
but probably not her because she was kind of like a faction of the the good Borg now or something like that. I don't know, right? Yeah. Either way, you know, um, the storyline, regardless of whether, you know, I, I, I can follow it, like them stealing lo- his body to get the code, to, 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 uh, all of that is not easy for me to kind of follow, but I'm not really in for it for that. I'm just watching the performances. I'm watching how the pace is. I thought the music, again, Doug mentioned the music, but we keep talking about the music over and over again. They're using the music strategically and with great impact. It is it is very well placed throughout uh, the, the episode, and it, it pulls on your emotional uh, heartstrings when you see it. So... It's just kudos to them all around. I mean, you know, watching the older, you know, the older crew uh, battling with the young under 25, let's say, <laughs> is really kind of a, it is a uh, microcosm of what Star Trek is at this point with what Doug Drexler was talking about as far as the older generation of the guys who did this stuff, the Mike Akutas, the Doug Drexlers, the original OG guys. And then there's the new batch of the young guys out here, the Terry Metallises, you know, the Kurtzmans, the, the, the young new guys that are bringing in new lifeblood into this. And so it, we are actually watching um, a microcosm of that kind of, um, you know, torch having been passed and repassed and, you know, this this new culmination of, of, of people that are working together who have a, a love for the show. So it's actually really special for me. You know, I also had a prediction. I predicted that Captain Shaw was going to die. And I also predicted that when he died, he would make some kind of comment about the the enterprise is yours now and he would call seven of nine seven of nine because that is that is the symbol of the redemption arc so and from the very first episode when he refused to call her seven of nine and it showed that it bothered her her i made a prediction that by the end of his arc whether he dies or whether he they just part ways or whatever he was going to in his final word call her seven and he did. And like you said, it's, you know, it's, we know what's going to happen, but it's the execution that matters. You know, it's, that's, that's what it's like in every script. Everybody has a great script idea. Every script idea has been done before. It's the execution that makes it a good script or not. And in this case, you know, it's also the directing. It's also the acting. It's, it's everything that makes it from you know from a great idea that we're all hoping for into a beautiful moment that we get and so that was really nice i really like that yeah i mean when you watch the lion king you know that the lion is going to be king you know it's pretty <laughs> much written in the title it's just how he's going to get there and uh and that's what i you know this journey has been fun for me it's it's good watching them get together and uh bring back the gang go through adventures you know at one point i was like so a runabout is going to go against the entire starfleet armada i was like how are they going to pull this off <clears throat> but clearly they had another plan and you know they brought us the they brought back the enterprise d great choice but i did want to ask you though ryan because i don't get the inside joke i don't have enough of the uh information what happened to the Enterprise E that Worf said it was not my fault? You know, I was trying to remember that. Uh, it was completely destroyed. Or, okay. you know, um, and I was trying to remember when he said that, because I do remember that destruction, and that is in Star Trek Nemesis, the final uh, Next Generation movie. Okay. But I was trying to remember how that's tied to wharf yeah and so everybody yeah everybody in the comments below please refresh our memory on this 
what was it that Worf did? Because what when he did that, I was immediately like, yeah, that makes sense. But I couldn't picture it. So everybody tell us what did what did Worf do this time? <laughs> Sec, that rascal gets everything blown up at one point or another. What did he do to the Enterprise E at the end of Star Trek Nemesis? Refresh that memory because it's I haven't seen it in like 20 years. That yeah. Movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Very good stuff. Um, also like the moment when Data, by the way, just really quickly, when he says she's perfect. Hang on. She, Sorry, I nailed it. I, just now, I was like, you know what? I'll bet you if, if there was the Borg Queen's voice in this, that person's voice must be in the credits of this episode. And I just, so I just checked and I, I fast forwarded through, you know, Patrick Stewart, Marina Sirs, boom, 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 boom. And right there it says, and special guest star, Alice Krieger as the voice of the Borg Queen. So, so they, in the episode, they don't, they don't want to spoil it. They want to tease it. They don't want us to know, but contractually they have to put her in the credits. So if you don't want to know, don't, you know, don't watch the credits, I guess, but there's only so much they can do, but it was her. Yeah, but I, that, I knew I recognized her They, they could voice. be throwing us off too, though. Don't, you know, don't sleep on Terry Metalis. He might be giving you her voice totally. and she gets credited and then they just bring in somebody totally different. That doesn't a hundred percent guarantee it. Absolutely. Cause we didn't see her face, but I knew right. that I recognized her. I was like, that is her voice because she was very heavily featured in Star Trek first contact, which is my favorite uh, Star Trek movie uh, directed by Jonathan Frakes, like everything else. <laughs> anyway, sorry, what were you saying? Uh, no, I, I, I'm glad that you picked up on the voice. I mean, I picked up on Majel's voice, for example, yep. and it was just, you know, undeniable. So, yeah, you hear the voices, you make certain connections in your head. Um, and it's not a guarantee. It certainly is very good attention to detail on the parts of the the Picard producers for getting that voice. But, um, you know, right now, once again, I don't know what's going to happen. I know that the good guys win in Star Trek and that's what we cheer for. But who are the but, good guys this time? <laughs> but we'll have to figure out who the good guys are. We're dealing with Changeling. We're dealing with Borg. And by the way, that's another thing I wanted to give credit to the writers for uh, by blending the Changeling and Borg storyline. They took two separate um Star Trek themes and found a way to uh, unite these uh, adversaries, these enemy enemies of the Federation. And, um, un, you know, if that were really the case, and if that were to really happen, then the Federation would really be finding themselves uh, fight, fighting a very difficult fight because that's, the, uh, you know, the odds are not in our favor when you talk about the boar getting mm -hmm. together with the changelings and whoever else are their allies. So um, these are they're they're really setting up a. A fighting block, you know, that would be, a, for example, a very uh, worthy competition for the Federation. Um, yeah. Boy, that's like the Dominion when the Dominion was combining with the Cardassians and then they were combining with right. the Marine. Yeah, this right. is a, it's quite an alliance. Hey, uh, before we go, let's do a little segment called Don Crandall Says, right? Don Crandall usually has some pretty good yeah. stuff. Um, he made a good point. He sends in, uh, he says, the planet Jack fondly remembers visiting with his mother was Raritan 4. We saw it briefly in the Picard season two episode. And he shows a picture. Here is that picture with Soji Dodge. Not sure which one that was. I don't quite remember if that was Soji or Dodge. I think it was Soji. Soji Berry. Yeah. Um, also, he says, 
Uh, oh, yeah. This is where Soji had a diplomatic meeting with the Deltons. Oh, yeah, that was really cool. Um, here's another image of that. Soji with the Deltons. I love how it gives us a little slideshow. There it is. Uh, good stuff there. Um, what else does he say? Uh, he mentions Commander Shelby. Uh, oh, he's got... God, this guy is so thoughtful. He said, here's a picture so uh, for Sorak so that you could see what she looked like back then with uh, Riker. Very cool. That was her. Now she's yeah. an admiral, of course. Well, now she's a dead admiral. And um, let's see. She was again played by Elizabeth Dennehy. We saw Captain Shelby on lower decks in a non-speaking cameo in an, an embarrassment of duplers. That's right. Here is Captain Shelby on lower decks. There it is. Next to the original alien concept design that Doug Jones's Saru was going to look like on <laughs> Discovery. No, really, this is what Saru was going to be this alien uh, when they first conceptualized Saru, but then, you know, through collaboration, they changed it to make him look like what, you know, the Kelpian that he looks like now. But this was the original concept design. If I remember correctly, everybody in the comments, correct me if I'm wrong, but this looks exactly like that alien that was the original concept for Doug Jones. That's Commander Shelby or Captain Shelby there. And uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, psh, he says... That was Alice Krieger supplying the voice of the Borg Queen. I guess I should read these ahead of time <laughs> because he just flat out says it for us. Uh, this was her. Uh, check this out with Locutus of Borg. That's Picard. Pretty awesome. And uh, she also has some very special moments with Data, which I don't want to um, spoil for you. Uh, let's see. Sounds like Worf may have blown up or crashed the Enterprise E sometime after Star Trek Nemesis. Okay, well, there's another answer. We should just read these ahead of time. Uh, and then he <laughs> says that's Major Roddenberry's voice again as the ship's computer. Um, that's it. Great. Thanks. Good stuff, Don Crandall. You should have told us sooner. He did. He sent that stuff in last night. Anyway, <laughs> I guess that's about it for us. Let's give a very special thanks to a few of our pals. And their names are, in alphabetical order, Homer Frizzell in uh, Walter Koenig's former apartment building in New York, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, TJ Jackson Bay, Bill Victor Arukin. Arukin. <laughs> Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, Mai, live from Tokyo, Mr. Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Jed Thompson, Steve Case, aka Joe Bugbuster, and of course, yeah. Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. Whew, good stuff. Sweet. That's about it. Can't wait for next week, right? Let's do it. Let's put a bow on this thing. Mm hmm. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm freaking excited out of my mind when I saw the Enterprise D bridge. I like, like everybody else, I turned into a blubbering mess. Um, I'm usually a blubbering mess anyway. Thanks very much, everybody. We will see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>